Look what we have down here. A giant centipede. This species of giant centipede is called Scolopendra angulata, and to my knowledge, this species doesn't really have a common name. And while this centipede does get quite large, it doesn't get as large as species like Scolopendra gigantea or the Amazonian giant centipede. But just like species like Scolopendra gigantea, Viridicornis, or Galapagoensis, Angulata does have the ability to feed on small rodents, snakes, lizards, and frogs. And this species has a fairly wide distribution. It pretty much lives throughout all of Central and Northern South America, given the right habitat. And that habitat is most frequently lowland forests with high humidity. And speaking of distribution, I believe that we are at its northern edge. Any further north, and that territory becomes Scolopendra gigantea dominated. As with many Scolopendra in the New World, handling this species generally isn't an issue. The chances that I get bitten by the centipede are relatively slim, and I only know of a few bite reports from this species. From what I understand, it isn't all that remarkable. It just causes an expected amount of local pain and swelling, or local edema. And the peak activity for Scolopendra in this region is still a bit far out, so it's really cool that we found this one. Going to return this one now. Large mossy boulders are what we are on the hunt for tonight, and that is because they are harboring a unique species of scorpion here in northern Colombia. So if we search long enough, we should be able to turn up a few. We have quite a behemoth of a rock here, and there are actually a few animals living on it. First one is right here. And this here is a Phrynus barbadensis, Barbados tailless whip scorpion. Second animal is right up here. Here it is. And you can see that this one is missing part of its right first leg. And you can see that this one is trying to bite me which is a bit rare with tail whip scorpions. And our third bug is right here. A small scorpion. It isn't full grown, but this is the one that we're looking for. So as you could just see there, those tail whip scorpions are tolerant of the scorpion species and vice versa. And trust me, it isn't because these haven't yet run into each other. They've almost certainly been living on that rock together for years now. That behavior isn't specific to this species of scorpion. There's many instances in which you can find whip scorpions living alongside scorpions. And the genus that this scorpion comes from, Chactus, is quite diverse. And most of the scorpions in that genus look normal. And this one is a bit of an outlier in the way that it has those long slender pedipalps or arms. And there is another species of Chactus a little higher up the mountain that looks quite similar but has even more slender hands. See there's a bit of niche partitioning going on where these take the dryer for forests and the ones higher up take the cloud forest. And unlike many of the scorpion species I've seen in the wild, I've noticed repeatedly with the species that they love to make improvised burrows. Basically they tend to burrow into pre-existing crevices in the embankments, but these crevices are not visible from the outside. So basically the scorpion is only putting in several centimeters of its own work into digging. Look what we have here, a velvet worm walking around in a leaf litter. This velvet worm here is an adult, and it's at about 5 centimeters compressed and about 8 centimeters uncompressed. And what I mean by that is when velvet worms are in resting state, they're shorter than when they are moving. As soon as velvet worms become mobile, they begin to stretch out. Of course, what these velvet worms are very famous for is their ability to shoot goo at prey, which they also shoot at predators sometimes. Here's a video of another one I found shooting goo. The main purpose of that goo is so that prey becomes immobile. Usually it causes arthropod legs to stick together. And while their diet mainly consists of arthropods, they do feed on other invertebrates as well, such as segmented worms. And these are strictly nocturnal, while during the day they most frequently hang out in rotting logs. And these parapatous velvet worms, as well as many other species, are semi-communal. So in these rotting logs, sometimes you can find families of several. And in all of my time spent looking at animals, this is one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me. This little velvet worm, believe it or not, was actually born during the making of this video. It started raining too hard to record, and so I placed them in a container for a little bit, and then when I reopened it, this guy showed up. Well then, I'm just going to leave these two on the forest floor now. This one can enjoy the first night of its life. We have a large styrodon moving around in the bush here. Here it is. This species should be Styrodon stolly, 
otherwise known as Stahl's giant katydid, and that is one of the most widespread and common species in this genus. This is a large female. It has a short ovipositor on its abdomen. In fact, all styrodon and katydid species in sister genera possess short ovipositors. These particular katydids use them to lay eggs on the borders of leaves or on branches, and this egg count is around 15 individuals. Now we didn't get to observe this behavior with the katydid we have here, but oftentimes when this katydid species is caught, it produces a rapid succession of chirping noises, some that I would describe as fairly high-pitched. And they do this by rubbing their wing covers together in the area that's right next to the thorax. And this katydid species is in all likelihood the largest one that can be found in the Sierra Nevada range in Colombia, where we are filming this one right now. This is also the largest styrodon that I've personally ever seen. And there you can see that it's using its mouth parts to clean off its feet, and it also uses its front feet to clean off the bases of its antennae. We have a Tayrona thick-tailed scorpion sitting on this tree up here. Let me get this one down really quickly. This scorpion here is a subadult, but this species just in general doesn't get very long. From their aculeus, which is the tip of the stinger, to the front of their carapace, they typically do not exceed three centimeters in length. And the binomial name of this scorpion species is Tydeus Tayrona, and Tayrona refers to the Tayrona people or culture of Colombia. And there's also a national park named after them on the coast. This species is described from their lands. And because this species is from the genus Tydeus, it does have a fairly painful sting. However, the venom potency in the genus Tydeus is well known for being quite variable, and this one is still quite far from being as venomous as some of the more toxic species in the genus. And while there are other Tydeus species that look similar to this one, such as Tydeus ocelot, where I am, this one can be discerned from other species just from its marbled pattern. And this species is semi-communal. In fact, the other day I lifted up a tile outside and there was two sitting on the underside. And in addition to this, they are semi-arboreal, which is somewhat interesting because in some areas where they live, there are no trees. Putting this one back up on the tree, We've got our second scorpion here, sitting on a rock. I had forgotten to mention with the last scorpion that we caught, this species is endemic to this mountain range, the Sierra Nevada range in Colombia, and that other similar species is also endemic. And not much is known about the scorpion's ecology, and that includes their diet, but one evening I did observe one eating a cockroach, so I think it is fair to assume that most of the time, if not all of the time, these are feeding on small arthropods. Also, tonight is almost a half moon, and this typically isn't very good for looking for scorpions because visibility is much higher, and the moon rises earlier. But here in this environment, there's quite a few trees, and it's typically overcast, so this variable frequently isn't as important the tropics. But that being said, ironically, it seems that the presence of the trees for the scorpion is not all that important. A few kilometers further out in the mountain, there's a long stretch of embankment that's completely exposed but still has scorpions on it. And this species is niche partitioning with Tydeus, like the one that we saw, especially in the way that these scorpions tend to live in burrows. Meanwhile, the Tydeus prefer to live in leaf litter or even more frequently off the ground in shrubs or trees. There's a Leptodactylus savagey sitting on the side of the road. It's a little tough to approach these sometimes. And there you have it. Its eye isn't actually red. That's just the effect from the light. It usually looks more like this. There we go. This is a very large frog too. I don't think I'm going to be able to catch it and I don't think I'm going to try to. This is its size here. Quite possibly the largest frog that's found in this region. And due to its size, it's able to eat snakes, among other things, like other frogs, lizards, stuff like that. And often you find these hanging out next to their burrow, but I don't see one here. So I'm going to poke this one and we'll see where it hops off to. I'm not sure what's going on. This usually doesn't happen. It's deciding to play tough. I don't know why this is. Very strange. Does that mean I can poke you? Yeah, I can. You don't want to leave? You know, when I started filming here, this one ducked down a couple times, very subtly, and I thought it was ready to just escape, but I'm not sure what's going on here. I wonder if I could get bitten doing this. Okay, well, I guess I'm just going to leave it alone then. 
we have quite a large click beetle here on this leaf. Now this species is either Chalco lepidius zonatus or limbatus. I personally don't know how to tell the difference. I think it's possible that both range into Colombia, but if not both, then it's probably zonatus. As soon as I grab this one, it will tuck in its legs and start making a clicking sound. And that's why they get their name. And if we watch this beetle click, you'll notice that the mechanism that allows for that sound is located in the sternum area. So there is a protrusion that comes from the thorax, and then when it lifts its head back, that part creates the clicking sound, and also creates the momentum for them to be able to flip up into the air. Speaking of which, I'm going to disturb this one a little bit and try to see if I can get it to flip up in the air. And though it doesn't look very effective, this is of course their way of evading predators. But to be clear, click beetles usually play dead before they start clicking. The clicking usually only starts when they're physically handled. Let's get this one back on its plant. Right over here we have an adult male, Holothiel lungipes. Now this species can be quick, but generally it is quite docile too. Just managed to catch it. This species is commonly known as the Trinidad pink tarantula, and this tarantula is considered to be a dwarf species. Average adults typically cap off at about eight centimeters in leg span. Like many new world tarantulas, these usually aren't inclined to bite as a defense, but also they lack an urticating hair patch on their abdomen, so they can't flick hairs at predators either. So when they are disturbed, the first thing that they'll do is retreat in their burrow, or if they're not near one, they'll just quickly scurry away. Even this one here is quite skittish. Another thing that you'll notice about this tarantula is that despite the fact that it has a fairly basic color plan, it does have some iridescent setae, and it's only appears to be true on their darker hairs. On this particular species, this iridescence seems to be mostly blue and teal, like you can see here on the leg. And I believe that this is the only species of holothiel that is found on the mainland. The other ones are found in the Caribbean. This one ranges into the northern countries of South America, as well as Panama. I'll just leave this one right in here. This is the slope that we found it on, and hopefully it goes and finds a female to mate with. Here we have a large adult Phrynus barbadensis, otherwise known as the Barbados whip spider. I've actually found this particular individual several times before on this path, and quite likely I'll see this one in future nights after I release it. Like many whip scorpions do, this one lives under the boulder adjacent to the one we found it on, in a cavity that goes beneath it. And one of the advantages of living in such an area is, even on nights when it rains, which albeit isn't all that frequent in this region, they can still hunt for prey. And that prey mostly consists of insects and other arthropods, but this is actually the largest Phrynus barbadensis that I've seen out here, and one of this size is likely also going to feed on small lizards that are living out here. The raptorial arms that these amblypygids have can easily pierce a small reptile scales if it can pierce the exoskeletons of insects the same size. I'm filming this in June and either the next month or the month after should be the period when these adults start to produce eggs and they carry those eggs on the underside of their abdomen under a thin film until they're ready to hatch into first instar. We have our third and final scorpion sitting in the rocks here. Another note on ecology regarding these guys, though they can be found in pretty xeric areas, they seem to be at peak population density near streams or rivers. And as with many animals, this isn't because they need access to the flowing water, but rather it is inherently more humid in those areas, and the scorpion is nearer to the water table. Now, I have seen a good number of these scorpions, but I will point out I've only seen one juvenile the entire time I've been here, sitting in a pile of rocks. So compared with other scorpion species I've seen, this might be one of the most extreme ratios of immature to mature scorpions that I've ever observed. I've also only seen a couple females in my time here, both of which were buried fairly deep in the ground. And it's unfortunate that I couldn't show you any of the females, because sexual dimorphism in this species is fairly stark. It's really only the males that have these shrimpy arms. The females look like what you'd expect other Chactus scorpions to look like. Regarding the scientific name of this species, the second name in the binomial Chactus brevicaudatus is an epithet and a fairly obvious one at that. It just roughly translates to short tail, which for this species is indeed accurate. Well, that is all of the scorpions that we are going to find tonight, so I'm going to end the video here, and thank you for watching.